So, Berto, did you see the new Michael Jackson documentary, Leaving Neverland? Have you seen it? I did. Oh, my God, I did. So do you want to talk about it? I almost don't, but I think it's probably for the best if we do. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, a professor, and I suppose my favorite Michael Jackson song before this documentary would have been Human Nature. Who are you, Berto? My name is Humberto Castaneda. Um, I design logos for sports teams, mostly. Uh, but since this documentary came out, I've been too depressed to do any of that. So tell me a story. What was it like watching this? Honestly, I, I wanted to watch it because, you know, obviously it's, a, it's an interesting topic. I, I grew up loving Michael Jackson. We've talked about this. Or loving his music, I should say. And uh, I did think that while I watched it, some things might come up in my head. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard before, I've talked in the past about when I was uh, five and six, I had, I was sexually abused by a 12-year-old uh, babysitter. And so I thought maybe some of that might come up as I'm watching it. Uh, but mostly I thought, you know, cool, it's another documentary. Let's, let's, let's see. The experience was quite difficult, but for most of it, it was just me if you could have filmed me, uh, the amount of seconds that I didn't shake my head in a no motion was probably only five seconds out of the four hours. It's like the whole time. I, I remember part of it, I was watching it at a bar and they must have thought I had some sort of neurological thing where my head doesn't stop moving because I was just, no, 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 the whole time. And, uh, and everything was sort of going like that. And then right towards the last bit, I, I think the last maybe 15 minutes or so, uh, when one of the guys sa finally says like, oh, and at that moment I knew that I had been abused, I lost it. I was on my way to the car. I was walking from the bar to the car and I just had like this, like, like I'm about to cry kind of thing. Like, and then I got in the car and it was Niagara Falls. It was basically... Uh, my little five-year-old self crying in that style too. It, it sounded like a child crying. Uh, by the way, it's funny I say Niagara Falls because I just came across a picture of me when I was five at Niagara Falls. And I was thinking, oh my God, that's how old I was. Just kind of weird. But I was just letting it out. Um, the first burst uh, lasted probably five full minutes. And it was a really weird thing that had never happened to me before. First off, I had never actually broken down like this about my sexual abuse. I had had a similar breakdown about my mom. So when I was little, my mom left and it was also traumatic. And, and many years ago, I had a similar breakdown about that. But this was the first time I'd had a crying breakdown about the, the abuse part. So that was really like surprising to me. And while it was happening, I was almost like a split personality in my mind because part of me was this adult having a conversation with myself of like, what's happening here? You know, I kept asking myself, what, what's going on? What, what is, where's the pain coming from? I mean, I was aware of what was the topic, but I wasn't quite aware what was the painful part. And I was having like this dialogue. And then the other part of me was just full little kid crying. And then I calmed down and I started driving home. And then on the way home, I had a few more bursts, like it, it just came out. So if someone was driving by, they're probably like, oh my gosh, that, that person's in a lot of pain, you know? Uh, so yeah, that was a surprising outcome for me, something I was not expecting. It felt cathartic in the end, but it was certainly not, not an expected thing. Is that when you texted me? Yeah, yeah, I, I do believe so. Yeah, yeah, so you texted me something along the lines of, have you seen Leaving Neverland? Yeah. Oh my God, or or you... You said something, right. some kind of vocalization, like, whoa, or something. Yeah. And at the time, I thought, I hadn't heard of the documentary. I thought it was Finding Neverland. Right, which, which it, is a different movie. Right, it's yeah. a movie with, I think, Ewan McGregor, if which I'm Which I've never mistaken. actually watched. And I initially was like, I think so, it was a while ago. But why is this evoking this reaction? <laughs> yeah. And I think I was like, oh, it must be a tearjerker or something. Oh, okay, I, okay, okay. And then for some reason, so we went back and forth on it a little bit, but I was still kind of confused because I wasn't really sure what, I think you thought I knew what you were talking about, but okay. I didn't really. 
And then... Because usually you're up on these things before I am. Uh, so I just figured you must have heard of it because I had just heard of it. So. Yeah, it is kind of weird. It had been out, I think, a month before mm. you and I watched it. And I uh, was... Um, I think a lot of people had asked us to talk about it, but I, I don't think I knew what people were talking okay. about or something. But um, I went you know, to see where I could watch it. And it's like, oh, it's on HBO. So on my computer, I just went into HBO on my computer right. and I thought, well, I'll, I'll watch 15 minutes of this. Oh, it looks like it's about four hours. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably watch this over the next couple of weeks if it's interesting. I yeah. don't know. I ended up watching almost the entire thing that night. <laughs> and and it's not comfortable to sit in my computer chair no. and watch my computer screen. Right, right. It was so riveting. Yeah. And I had a similar cognitive reaction right. of, sh of shaking my head. <laughs> and the whole time I'm, I was thinking, oh, I bet you this got to Birdo. Right. Oh, I bet you this got... Because the two men, uh, Wade Robson and Jimmy Safechuck, they, the whole documentary, if you haven't seen it, is these two grown men. They're probably 35, 40 years right. old-ish. yeah. And they're recalling in full detail th basically their entire relationship with Michael Jackson. Right. Going from the first time they met to their infatuation to they, you know, uh, oh my God, Michael Jackson wants me to hang out at his, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. To, the fantasy, like the crazy dream come true. Right. To the sleeping in his bed, to the explicit sexual acts. Yeah. It's interesting because you know it's kind of heading in that direction, but they don't really get to the sexual acts until like hour two and a half or so. It takes yeah. a while, but you just know it's coming. And then what, once you get there, you're, you, you've already kind of bonded with these two guys. Right. And as they're talking about it, it is just one of the most affecting <sighs> descriptions of sexual abuse I've ever heard. Yeah. Because they're not screaming about it. They're not, although I was like, why aren't you screaming about <laughs> right. it? But they're, they're t saying it a very precise, careful, I mean, careful is not the right word, but in a very, I don't know, it it just comes across as very calm and right. believable, but you can sense you can sense emotion. And sometimes they cry. You can you can sense some tension, but it's done so in this. The director and whoever managed to get these interviews uh, put together this really great um, document yeah. of what it's like to be sexually abused. I mean, that's one thing. It's like okay, great, this is about Michael Jackson. But I think more because who really he's dead, you right. know, and and we're just talking about now uh, setting the record straight and maybe getting some monetary adjustments mm -hmm. for this. Who and I don't really care about that. What I do care about are people today who are going through this sort of thing right. or recovering from this sort of thing. And so I think everyone should watch this. It's extremely entertaining too. I mean, yeah. so if you haven't watched it, you might be like, oh God, I don't want to watch two guys talk about for four abuse. hours, right? It is the reason why, if that was all that it was for me, I, I would have been like, yeah, I've heard clients talk about this sure. hundreds of times. I, I don't really need to hear another description of it. What's so interesting is they interview the, the moms, they interview other siblings, they talk about their lives. Each one of these guys had kind of a career that was yeah. propelled by Michael Jackson connectivity. They have all this video and picture footage of these two young boys with Michael Jackson. It's kind of like time capsules of these little periods in time in the 80s and 90s. Right. It, all of us, or at least all of us of a certain age, remember this time. Right. We remember Thriller. We remember Off the Wall. We remember yep. Bad. We remember the videos. We remember the outfits. We remember the the way things looked. We remember Macaulay Culkin and the yeah. and Priscilla Presley and you know a Blanket. You know all these things we remember. Totally. But this completely alters the entire history. I mean, you know, Michael Jackson is a part of our lives. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you were actually kind of one of these kids, which yeah. I, I don't know if this actually resonated with you, but. As I'm watching, like the Wade Ro Robeson kid in Australia, yeah, he's five years old and he's dressing up as Michael Jackson. Yeah. He's a white kid. By by the way, both of these are 
some of the cutest white kids you've ever seen. Right. And so I And they had talent in some way. Like one was a dancer and the other one was like an actor. imitating his moves and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is actually debatable. Like one of the interesting just a side note was the Wade Robson guy ends up becoming the choreographer for In Sync right. and Britney Spears during their heyday. And uh, and so, you know, it was all predicated on this uh, he won this dance competition in Australia mm-hmm. in this small town, or maybe it was Perth. What I don't know what town it was, but in this town, and he uh, was five years old, and and they don't really show a lot of his dance moves at the time. But I would, <laughs> he didn't look very good at dancing. He just <laughs> well, looked, was a five year old, right? right? Yeah. But you would expect, you know, someone who eventually became this one of the best choreographers in the world would have exhibited some innate talent. At the age of five, but he didn't. What what I learned from this is like basically, if you train early, you, right, ten thousand hours young, yeah, and yeah. you just do it over and over again, you don't yeah. necessarily have to have any particular talent, yeah, in that, you, you know. Yeah, no, it, I mean that that's the whole. If you watch the NBA or any sport, you can tell that most of them are there because of that, because they started training in that sport when they were young. Right. Some of them also happen to be extra gifted, right? Like it's like the confluence of both yields like a Jordan or something. <laughs> right, I mean, maybe that's the kicker that pushes you over the edge, right. that differentiates you from a, you know, I don't know, a uh, deadlift shrimp to a Michael Jordan. Sure. But uh, just to bring us back to the 90s, but anyway, yeah, so uh, it has all those elements, and it's actually, it's really interesting. You get to see all these behind-the-scenes photos. It just completely altered my childhood in ways. I'm yeah. like, so Michael Jackson, I mean, not only just the sexual abuse, which is completely mind-blowing, but also the fact that he was, like, hanging out with, like, regular families. Yeah. And he... Traveling w- with them. And- yeah, and, like, faxing. It's bizarre. <laughs> he was, like, faxing this one family, like hundreds of faxes a day he like yeah. gave this family a fax machine so he could and they kept all these little notes that he sent yeah. and, and that's super childish notes right, right, right. oh and then and then it also because i remember the black and white video or sorry yeah uh, black and white video with macaulay culkin right but i had no idea of the backdrop like oh macaulay you know and macaulay culkin denies that anything happened to this day but well, what do you think about that well i it's it would be, it, it's very hard to believe that he just broke his pattern just because he, Macaulay Culkin, is more famous than the other ones. Right. And if we watch kind of how his trajectory has gone since he was a child star, uh, whether it, it was this or other things, I think a lot of messed up stuff probably happened to him when he was young. Right. So he doesn't seem to have landed super well. Yeah. The thing about this documentary is how weird it is for a the arguably the most famous person that had ever lived that right. has ever lived right to have essentially 12-year-old boyfriends with him all the time yeah that people knew they were sleeping they saw them all the time they they holding, knew they'd sleep holding hands yeah sleeping in the same bed uh when Michael traveled, he he would bring them, and he would leave the fam the parents like in an, in yeah. another part of the hotel. Yeah, and in plain sight. Right. And none of nobody did anything. I mean, there there were, yeah, because actually in the in the late eighties, most of the rumors were really more about wait, why is he becoming so weird? He's becoming white. His he's having a lot of plastic surgery, and then I think there were things about like, well, maybe he's gay. Is that a thing? Whatever. Um, and then in the nineties, the rumors started cause I think someone sued, right? Like someone actually sued. And then, uh, and then ev- everyone started having those conversations, but you're right for a long time, at least a decade, it was in everyone's faces. Yeah. At the height of his fame. Yeah. And when you watch this documentary, you see that he had an absolute pattern that got more and more, mm. uh, blatant yeah. in a lot of ways. And he liked boys of a particular age. Yeah. And he did the same things with all of them. He dressed them in that hat. Like mm-hmm. each one of them would have that hat. Right. Like they were like mini me's essentially for Michael Jackson. Which by the way, the the other sad thought I had throughout the whole thing is 
how brutalized he must have been himself. Right. So the reason why people are asking us to do this episode uh, in the in the past week or so, a lot of people have been asking us to talk about it, partially because people would, this would be something they'd want us to talk about, but also because we did a deep dive, I don't know, what, six months ago on yeah. Michael Jackson? And I just kind of randomly th- said, I think we should kind of look into this. I- I've never really... I remember that, yeah. I've never really had an opportunity to really look into it. Because uh, there's so many psychological things you could comment on. Yeah. The, obviously, the uh, allegations of sexual abuse to children, but also his... Uh, his skin issues, his his, um, yeah. his voice, the abuse he went through, uh, the uh, plastic surgery, the death from uh, the uh, substances he was been given by his physician, and I I had never really and it, you know when the news was out when the news was big mm-hmm. about this it was in the nineties. In the 90s, I was in my 20s, and I didn't have cable TV, one. Right. I didn't have a newspaper. There was no internet. <laughs> so I was basically completely cut off from pop culture. And so right. I, I really had no knowledge. I heard... So you might have heard from the periphery. like some, Totally. Yeah. And even if I wanted to follow it, which I wouldn't have when I was 25 years old, I, I really just had no idea. And so when we did the deep dive... I wanted to answer the question for myself. Right. What's the likelihood that the allegations are are true? Mm-hmm. Even on this on the small end, you know, like Yeah, yeah. cuz cuz it was it was a fact that he confirmed that he would sleep with these kids in his right. bed. But and the other like, people would confirm that too. Yeah, yeah. everyone agreed, the parents, yeah. the kids, the Michael himself and the helpers and yeah. they would say, yeah, Michael would sleep in his big bed. But it's it's nothing wrong. They would always wear PJs. That's ignorant. Yeah. And so uh I was like, okay, well, so either and the so the conclusion I got to was he's either extremely irresponsible like if yeah. he if he didn't sexually abuse these kids he's extremely immature and mm-hmm. irresponsible because after he had been sued he continued to do it <laughs> right out in the open yeah and very, every, very chaotic in that sense <laughs> and people would ask him like you've been sued for having someone accused you in court of having sex with them yeah. they were 13 and you continue to have boys and kids sleep in your bed. Why are you doing this? Was and any it, like, uh, well, yeah, but since I haven't done anything, like, there's no problem. Right. I, yeah. But, you know, it'd be one thing if he was an unfamous uncle. <laughs> it's another thing when you're Michael frickin' Jackson. <laughs> yeah, so the whole, whole world spotlight. Yeah. yeah. And so it was like, either he's really dumb and or really confused or really right. immature or something's wrong or there's some smoke with or the fire. <laughs> obviously he was sexually abusing his kids yeah. and at the time of the deep dive i only had the benefit of of really two cases that had been that had mm-hmm. gone to court both of them were acquitted yeah cuz we talked about it and i remember that almost changed my perspective a little bit cuz i was a little bit more on the camp of oh yeah i'm sure he did and at the end of it, I was sort of like, well, okay, it's kind of hard to tell. Right. It was really hard to tell. Yeah. A lot of kids came forward, including Robson and... To, to defend him. <laughs> and Safe Chuck came forward, as they detail yeah. in the documentary so well. It totally, it all makes sense. when totally. you When you see the progression, the whole story makes... Because if you just have the tagline of like, two fellas who adamantly claimed for decades in court and out of court right. that nothing ever happened with Michael Jackson are suddenly talking flipping ab- and suing him for money. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, that seems a right. little funny. But when you watch this documentary, it is so convincing. Yeah. I mean, the the way they tell the story and the the pro- the progression and I I'm not no one can tell when other people are lying. I'm just going to tell you that. Sure. There's no special skill there's no one on this planet that is particularly good at it. What about like Professor X? Yeah, there's uh, there's no lie detector test that mm-hmm. that is effective. Right. There's just no way to know. Having said that, I have talked with it, a lot of people who either have a incentive to lie or to not lie to me, mm-hmm. particularly in my the early part of my career, 
And over time, I got pretty good at detecting when someone was lying, or at least pretty good at suspecting and, and getting used to the rhythm of a conversation that that was more of a liar. And it, I imagine detectives have a similar knowledge. Yeah. You know? They're talking to someone who's innocent, and there's a certain flow to the conversation that you just don't get from someone who's trying to lie, yeah. even, if, even if they've had lots of time to develop the lie. And the way these guys talk, it's, I am 99.9% .9 sure they're telling the truth. It, it's, I, it, I, leave, I leave that 0.1% because you just never know. But the entirety of the presentation and the entirety of all the details, uh, and the, fact, the main fact is, the reason why people don't come forward is because of the stigma. And so if someone's going to come forward, in all likelihood, yeah. they have, you know, it, they, there's so much pressure behind them to actually overcome yeah. that stigma and to incur all the hate and all the bad press and everything. Absolutely. So one of them is a successful uh, industry person. He's, as you said, was the coach for NSYNC, for uh, Britney. He has a reputation. He's known. He's made plenty of money. And then he had this breakdown where he had to walk away from it. So is the motivation, well, now he needs money, so what can he do? Okay, well, then he should actually also start acting in movies because, oh, my God, right? And then the other guy, even better, like give him two Oscars because it's like you don't see – a movie with the best actors we know that is that well acted. <laughs> right. It, 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 and, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't even speak to as many people as you do for a living or anything like that. But, you know, I, I have to design a lot of logos for companies. And every time I'm talking to them, you can tell when I'm making shit up. <laughs> I thought it was sports teams, mostly. Uh, yeah, mostly. So I want to apologize because in that last deep dive... My conclusion was 60-40. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm 60% sure that he did it and 40% that he didn't right. based on the evidence. Um, I want to apologize for not believing the victims. I should, have, I should have believed the victims. Having said that, I didn't do that much of it. Like, I had no access to the interviews. Totally. All I had was essentially what's on Wikipedia, yep. which is not helpful when trying to get <laughs> nuance in the full breadth of the story. Well, and, and to be fair, there is a difference between, hey, two people came forward. Uh, I don't know if, if you heard of Joe Bobby down the street, but they accused him of this, that, and the other thing. That's one thing. There's another one, which is, hey, the richest artist in the world, one of the richest people in the world, is being sued by families that he gave this, that, and the other thing to. That sad but it makes it almost instantly less believable it's like oh i see you're coming for some money now yeah especially because his reputation was actually as this nice helps everyone you know and which of course is dumb because yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> one that has that's just that's not correlated right. two when you're trying to get families to trust you you learn how to be really nice one of the children had a description of a mark on his penis yeah and they confirmed that that was accurate. Yeah. And I think it was like, well, he might have seen it when we were showering. It's like, why were you showering? Like, uh. Yeah, it's really awful. Uh, <sighs> I, I blame it on a lot of things. One is, is just, I guess, I was succumbing to the general... Uh, w when you're waiting those stories, yeah. that I did... I, I was not... I was falling victim to not giving enough weight to when people come forward, in all mm -hmm. likelihood, it's it's true. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I wasn't, you right. know. But I think like one of the kids later like rec recanted the story or something. I don't know. So then that would make it. Well, it, but that is a great point because, um, you know, it's hard for, as we've talked about, any victim to come forward. Then for a male victim to come forward and say, this grown man did all sorts of sexual things to me. uh they, they must really want money really badly. Yeah. I kind of wish that they weren't asking for money, you know? Yeah. Because, or very little, like just therapy costs or something, because it does you know, sort of muddy the waters a little but bit. That, so on the one hand, I see what you're saying from a credibility standpoint, but if I were them, I would want to burn, once I realized what had actually happened... I would want to burn the world down. Yeah, I just wish there were other ways that were less 
muddying of their credibility, you know. Not that I, I'm not, I'm not, conv- I don't think that they're not credible, but, but I'm, you know, we were also, or I was also tricked by the lawyers. The yeah. lawyers, I mean, think about the, the lawyer. I mean, they had, um, Michael Jackson had what's his face who got they OJ had Cochran uh, Cochran, the <laughs> best you know muddying of the waters guy of all time. Yep. Uh, the media also wasn't really re- like when I Not looked really. at reports, it wasn't. It was. It sh- now I'm sure it'll be less this way. When most people were cheering for MJ, right? Right. right exactly. Um, the internet, including Wikipedia, wasn't very accurate. You know, or yeah. wasn't giving enough credibility to to the reports and the super fans i mean we after we published that episode in which i was basically saying 60 40 yeah i can't i think i turned off the comments i remember you telling me that (laughs) yeah i think i turned off the comments on that episode because one we were just getting a lot of just real awful comments Mm -hmm. about just god knows what but one of the main threads was that we were not we were like the devil for <laughs> suggesting that maybe he had done those yeah. things. There's this rabid Michael Jackson fan base yeah. on the internet that is ready to pounce at any implication, even though I was like 60 40. Yeah, so well, yeah, in the documentary, they talked about and in the Oprah, did you watch the Oprah thing afterwards? No, they, but I, was, I, well, I saw some clips. They were talking about all the death threats they've received, and the vi- they showed clips of the YouTube videos that have been posted, just railing against them and yeah. calling them opportunists and traitors and everything. Well, let's take a break. When we get back, let's continue the talk. What do you say, Bruno? Let's do it. We're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Um, what would wait? What kind of dance move would Wade Robson do to convince people to become a patron of the podcast, Berto? Describe it so that podcast people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, he would first start with sort of the little, you know, the foot shuffle where one foot jets forward and the other one kind of the knee bends. Why? Uh, because that's kind of like an attention getting move. Oh. And then one arm shoots up. Oh. And then when everyone turns to see what's up, a little quick spin. Into a moonwalk. Oh, nice. Yeah. So um, the other things that I wanted to say that the documentary did really well was that y- you basically learn what it looks like when an abuser has essentially a romantic and sexual relationship with a child, mm-hmm. again, in plain sight. It's, it's a interesting, like, I- I've worked with people who have been sexually abused, and the descriptions that we get into have more to do with like the bad moments, I guess. Yeah. Cause the, uh, cause I guess that's more relevant to the therapy, but this documentary again, for the first hour and a half, the, the two guys are talking about all the good times. <laughs> yeah. They're talking about how they loved Michael Jackson and how, and then even as the sexual, the sexual stuff be, starts to happen, they still frame it as if, they were in love. It was something they did because they loved each other. Yeah. It, Even though part of them knew that it was it was certainly very confusing for them. You know, well, of, <laughs> I, I don't know because I'd have to rewatch those parts of it. But the way they framed it was like it it was it was slightly confusing. Yeah. It was like, well, that seems kind of weird. But but it didn't. But they weren't busted up about it. Not busted up externally, and but like for example, when the one guy's describing when he was actually trying to have anal sex with him, and how it was painful, and right. how it didn't work, and how then like he didn't, he like cut him off for a bit or something. It's like that clearly there was he must have been like this is odd, <laughs> this is confusing. This, but that this was does like hurt. that was like seven years in or yeah, something. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's a really good because. It, particularly, I think for people who don't hear these stories, we have this lecherous, evil person who lives under a bridge a visualization of someone who does this sort of thing and what rape of a child looks like. Yep. What it often looks like is this, where the yep. person becomes a friend, uh, like the abducted in plain sight documentary. Uh, Which I haven't watched, but I heard great things about. It's interesting. I mean, I, Maybe it takes a twist or something. I've watched maybe the first 45 minutes. Oh, okay. 
it's i mean it's interesting but it, i don't know it, it's just another documentary about a horrible thing that happened but there's um, that seduction aspect right well the seduction and also the extreme um the, they the abuser pays very close attention to making sure that everyone would think they would be the last person on the planet to do such a thing. Ah. You know, like they spend, they, they go into the relationship with the family knowing from day one, they have to paint a picture so that when the time comes, they will be the least likely to do such a thing. Interesting. You, you know, they can't just waltz in. They have to like, create a, a a marketing campaign beforehand, mm. you know? And that's what Michael did. You know, yeah. he, be, he became the family, he became a family member. He became the world's family member. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I think about, in my case, um, it, it was necessarily not a little different. It was very different in that the the abuser was not only someone that the, the so what happens is my dad would drop me off with this family so they would watch me in the mornings while my dad went to work and many oftentimes after school as well, sometimes on the weekends, things like that. And the, little, the family had a little boy my age. This was in, in Queens. And they had a niece. I, I'm pretty sure it was their niece. And she was 12 years old. And so she would watch us when they weren't around. So this wasn't like someone that in, in, inserted themselves into the family. They were part of the family, right? And she's 12, and so if no one knew that she had been abused, which she probably was, but who knows, then there was no reason to suspect this little 12-year-old girl of anything, right? And similar like in this story, this did it, This wasn't a, hey, little kid, I'm going to sexually abuse you. You better shut your mouth. No, that never happened, right? It was like, hey, I'm going to show you something really interesting. And, you know, I was like, whoa, you know, and she told me like, do you know what making love is? I'm like, no. Well, and it was and, like this world that she was exposing me to. But you've talked about before, correct me if I'm wrong, that because she was older, she seemed really cool. Totally. I mean, she was pretty, and I was like, oh. And when she paid attention to you at all, yeah. you felt really cool. Really special. Yeah. Which is emulative of what yes. these two guys felt when Michael Jackson paid attention. That's right. But at the same time, and I have these crisp some of the most vivid moments i have one of them is hiding behind the couch to do this stuff but that wasn't the only place and then the other vivid memory is um you know like there were things about the actual acts that grossed me out but i went along with it so part of my mind was going like oh this is gross but the other part of my mind was like, I guess this is what you do or something, you know, like that kind of thing. And so that's why I was suggesting that there, that might've been a, a, a moment in their heads where they're like, oh, this is weird, but we're in love. So I guess this is what you do, you know, and then you just kind of go along with it thinking somehow this is normal, right? Uh, the, the other, actually, the other memory I have is the other little boy was also getting abused and we would talk about it. And our conversation was like kind of bragging to each other about it and sort of like vying for who might be the favorite, that kind of thing. And it's crazy, right? And oh, and then there were other things. One time we were on a, we had all taken a trip to like the beach or something and we were staying in a little cabin. And in my little five-year-old mind, I sort of knew we were not supposed to talk about stuff but my filter wasn't developed. So at one point I'm like, oh, can I take a shower with her? Can, you know, like I was asking if we could take a shower together. And I remember the adults actually considering it because I'm five, so it's like, what's the harm I think they were thinking? But then like they decided against it and I was like really disappointed by that. And she was really disappointed. Like, it was weird. Hmm. So did you ever think about telling anybody when you were a kid? No. <laughs> Well, not that I remember. And I remember I had I had things that happened that I couldn't explain to my dad. For example, I had written a little love note to a classmate. And then it said, I said something like, I want to make love to you. And my dad found the note. And he, and he was like, do, do you know what this means? And I was like, not really. And I, I obviously couldn't talk about anything. Um, and so, no, I... I couldn't really, I didn't really think of talking about it. And frankly, I didn't tell anyone at all 
till I was in college. I think I was 19 and I mentioned it to a buddy, but almost as a brag because I still hadn't internalized that it was abuse. So I was like, oh yeah, like when I was five, what happened was blah, blah, blah. And then I remember my buddy who actually in all other cases would probably be like, that's cool. He was like, that's actually not, that's kind of messed up, man. I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm like, no, no, it's fine. It was totally fine. I was like, I liked it. It was fine. And it took me years till I, you know, after a panic attack and after therapy of, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Which was depicted in the documentary yeah. that they were defending Michael Jackson during mm -hmm. that age period, even though they knew it had happened to them yeah. because they hadn't interpreted it as abuse. Right. They had, it, the, the narrative in their mind was, we had a beautiful relationship yeah. and it was mutual, so to speak. And I know I can't talk about it because, yeah. you know, that would be bad, but, but I, you know, it's a good thing. And then as they age, uh, the symptoms start to emerge, <laughs> which is extremely well described in this documentary. And that's another thing I think you really learned from this is that just because a 19 year old is like, yeah, no big deal. Doesn't mean that they're not going to eventually be suicidal by the time, yeah. by the time they're 27. Right. Which is an interesting phenomenon of psychology. Totally. And I, so one of the things that was going through my head was how much damage I feel I actually incurred from something that happened. I mean, it wasn't every day and it was only at most for a span of two years at most, and maybe it was a year and a half, but at most two years, from uh, someone who was still, you know, a 12 year old, not like a full grown person. And yet I incurred so much mental damage from that, right. you know, to, to this day. I, I mean, I will never really be fully over it, but but I had, you know, therapy, all these things. And I, so many uh, risky behaviors I did, all these things. I can't, I was like, oh my gosh, this little kid, he started like seven till, 14. For 14, like s seven years by the biggest star in the planet in the weirdest, most surreal environment pot. Like, oh my God. With your mom sleeping right next With to you. Oh my God. I was like, I was, I was, I was wondering how he was still even keeping it together. Well, and <laughs> they depict that a little bit, yeah. right? He, they get, they both get married. They both have a son and they both start to have massive PTSD right. symptoms. And they go to therapy, and then they start to come out of the closet. And all this mainly happened after Michael had died, which was 10 years ago, which is shocking right. to think about. Right. I guess the one guy had already said no to Michael about testifying in his favor, but he hadn't come out publicly. He had just right. said no about testifying. Well, both of them had... Uh, pushed back at a certain point because Michael, whenever there was another allegation, <laughs> Michael would reach out to them and suddenly give them all this, all this uh, attention <laughs> right. and also like try to rope them in. And they both kind of were just like, you know, let's just, it, Jimmy was particularly like, no, this is over, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, should we blame the mothers, Berto? So on the one hand, absolutely, especially... If I was going to be grading these, like I th the Australian one, I think. Yeah, the Australian one was over the top ridiculous. But, I mean, they arrive there, meet Michael Jackson, and then they were all supposed to go to the Grand Canyon. And they're like, all right, I guess we'll see you later. And they go off to the Grand Canyon and leave the kid behind. Yeah, and Wade was seven at this time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I couldn't imagine leaving my 40-year-old child with someone. <laughs> let alone a seven-year-old that is insane it doesn't matter who it is like they just met this person it was it was already like bad practice to like okay i guess you can spend the night in his but i guess your sister's there so an adult can't do something to two kids at once can they fine <laughs> that was already bad enough but then you just leave your child for probably what a week two weeks it was it was a while <laughs> well, yeah, and multiple other incidents. Yeah, and then, and then like full summers. 
Right. And and then he he even asked for a full year, and finally she drew the line. She's like, oh, that's too much. Yeah. If you haven't watched the documentary, you should do so. But one of the other details was when they would go on tour, Michael would bring one of these kids and yeah. would essentially have to bring the family too. The kid would always sleep in Michael's hotel room, and slowly the uh, Michael would move the family further and further away <laughs> in this very systematic way. Like the first week, they're right next door. The second week, they're down the hall. The third week, they're on another floor. Yeah. And and it just progressed from there. And it just it's it's how it's how abusers will do this sort of thing. Right. That was the other thing that really shocked me, because. Even before when I thought, yeah, I, I was like, yeah, I probably believe that he abused the kids. In my mind, he was kind of like this child himself who was like, well, I don't know. I just couldn't help but touch them. They're so pretty, you know. But this was a calculating, yeah. manipulative, long-term planner. Yeah. So predatory. Yeah. You particularly see that when he is acute. So basically, Michael Jackson, had a, he was a serial monogamous. He had a series of child boyfriends yeah. that he would have, and they would only last a certain amount of time for one reason or another. And, and sometimes it was because Michael, a lot, at least to the Wade and the Jimmy situation, Michael got tired of them because they got too old yeah. or the parents started asking too many questions. And Michael was just like, <clears throat> I'm, done with, I'm done with this family and this kid. But he would immediately jump you know, to someone else. And uh, every time there would be some sort of allegation, Michael would go back through his black book of like abused kids and call them up and start to try to make sure that they don't yeah. speak out against him because he knew that the press and, and the legal system would come asking like, yeah. so you slept in Michael's bed. Are you sure nothing happened? <laughs> right. And to, and the way that these two guys and the mothers will describe the way Michael would, would do that is extremely calculated, totally. extremely manipulative, extremely transparent, uh, and not someone who was uh, confused or no. pathological. You know, like no. like schizophrenic kind of a thing. No. You know, they meaning that they weren't in control of their faculties. Um, so, so my take on the mothers, Berto, is is completely different than yours, and I think the rest of society. I think that this documentary actually, to me, and I, no one else saw this as far as I can tell, to me, it actually exonerates the mothers, in my opinion. Not that they're off the hook completely, for sure. But again, we're talking about the 80s and 90s, when, particularly the 80s. This is eons before the Me Too movement, right. before awareness of, of sexual abuse. It was completely unheard of like in the 80s so in the 90s and 2000s our my industry was trying to educate the public that rapists weren't people that jumped out at you from the bushes mm -hmm. and and it seems like i think pe people especially young people today forget that just 20 years ago that was a novel idea yeah so if we go all the way back to the 80s we didn't even we didn't talk about it at all yeah. we didn't talk about sexual abuse at all like there was the different strokes, very special episode. That was like mind blowing yeah. at the time. And not only that, but like when you think about all the gay guys who were famous at the time, like George Michael and uh, Liberace and Elton John, they weren't necessarily, or and uh, Freddie Mercury and everything, like they weren't necessarily known. Yeah. You know, even though it was sort of known to a lot of people. The press didn't talk about it. People didn't want to hear about it. And if they did, they didn't believe it. Right. So as far as we knew, no famous male stars were gay. Or sexual. Like there was yeah. nothing, there was no notion. It w We were just completely denied. We were basically kind of like in the 50s when we just didn't acknowledge sexuality. Sure. I mean, we were emerging out of that, but... I don't think people remember, like the 80s, it was almost like inconceivable right. to imagine that this sort of thing would happen. And so as a mother... There were no sex tapes or little found iPhone footage or selfies with nude pics and... Or allegations yeah. that were known, yeah. you know, that the press would talk about in 
in uh, sensible markets. You know, yeah. it's not, the six o'clock news didn't talk about, even though there might have been some reports of like JFK had sex with Marilyn Monroe or something. Like, you know, uh, respectable people didn't talk about such things in the yeah. 80s. And so there's that. Two, Michael Jackson was ginormously famous. It would be like thinking you couldn't leave Obama alone with somebody because of course like Obama isn't going to abuse your kids he's too famous for that like even well, if he was that sort of person he certainly wouldn't risk his career on such a stupid thing but Obama wouldn't ask you to leave your 7 year old to sleep in his bed well <laughs> unless he was an abuser you know i'm not right i'm not I, saying from the obama i'm saying right. from the i'm talking from the mother's point yeah. of view i think i i hear you and i and i think you make a great point uh, it doesn't. It doesn't change the fact that the the boy was seven. So I mean, I could see the argument, which it sucks because it still would have panned out the same way. But I could see the argument with like the eleven, twelve year olds. Like, hey, it's a teenager. Uh, they're gonna hang out. Uh, cool. Right. But the, right. But the other thing here is that the notion of sexual abuse was so foreign to people. One. Two, the notion of boys being sexually abused was almost non-existent. Yeah. It still is to some extent, which is another thing yeah. that this documentary puts forward, which is like, it doesn't matter what gender you are as a child, you're just as vulnerable to being sexually abused. And so the notion that boys could be sexually abused, I mean, for you, like, uh, was would you implicate your father in leaving you alone with that babysitter? Uh, not with the babysitter, but definitely. But shouldn't he? Sh shouldn't he have known? Shouldn't he have done something? He was leaving her, you alone with this perfect stranger he didn't know very well. Well, but that's just it. Like these, these were friends we hung out with, right? Like the parents were. Uh, I think. I think the thing I implicate him with is different, and he didn't technically have a lot of choices, but because he worked, he was in a residency. Uh, but he left, he, like one day he left me, we rang the doorbell, no one had answered outside of a building in Jackson Heights, Queens. And he had, he was late for work. So he's like, okay, well they're probably there. And then he left. But that's a separate issue. I well, mean, that but that, that's part of the problem is I was not guarded enough. <laughs> right. Which <laughs> was know? very common for parents yeah. to do back then. Yeah. And again, if you're struggling with things, it, it makes yeah. it harder to, to do. So my, my point is, is that uh, be, you know, what's the saying? Like, lest thee have a sliver, in, uh, you know, a, a plank of wood in your own eye, you know, don't, yeah, anyway. Yeah. The, 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 you don't really know what it's like to have lived back then. Sure. The other thing is like, if we blame these mothers, we have to blame all parents who have ever had a child who was sexually uh, abused by someone outside the family. Now, some parents can absolutely be, uh, can I mean, be blamed. But there's extremes, right? Like, so, so let's say for a second, which I don't agree with, but let's say for a second that that first time where they go on to the Grand Canyon and leave their seven-year-old behind with this adult male that they just met, fine. Let's say they're just not used to this. But she saw so many building signals Right, that like she herself was saying, like we kept staying lo uh, further and further. Uh, the doors were locked. Uh, I, I get it, but at the same time, how many mothers and fathers, for that matter, fell for it? And 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 reasonable, loving, caring, intelligent, attentive parents all fell for the same trick. He wasn't just like walk up to a boy and said snatch i want to sleep with him it was this and that's what the documentary walks you through was like the step-by-step -step process that michael jackson would do and then the cover-up that he would do afterwards and then the impression management he would do and all that kind of stuff it, it worked really well and you know michael must have known or he found out through trial and error that kids actually don't talk about it they you know they don't want to talk about it particularly if he convinces the kid to fall in love with him again some parents are absolutely to blame. Some of them actually abuse the kids themselves. But, and some of you out there, because I'm guessing, you know, a good percentage of you, if you have, if you follow typical statistics, have been sexually abused. Some of you absolutely can blame your parents. But the vast majority of parents who are, who have kids who have been through stuff like this, um, it's, 
it's quote unquote their fault, but it's more of a fault of our society in that, for example, with you, if she had punched you in the face every time that she babysat you, you knew from societal messages that you could go to your dad and say, she's punching me in the face or some other right. kind of similar report or right. you know, other behavior that's not sexuality. There was something about this behavior that society had told you, even though your dad never said, never tell me about this, no one ever directly told you this, but there was something about your learning up until the point you were five where you're like, there's other things I would tell my dad, but this one, I can't tell my dad. Right. This one, I don't, I don't tell anyone about this. Yeah. This, there's something about this that I just know you're not supposed to talk about. That's our fault. The, the reason why these kids didn't come forward, the reason why all the R. Kelly p- kids you know, had trouble coming forward is because we as a, and I always talk about this, we as a society stigmatize sex in general. We particularly stigmatize victims of abuse, which is ridiculous. Um, and we also will punish them when they actually come forward. I mean, these two right. guys, I mean, is it any wonder why they didn't come forward? I mean, the reaction would have been worse yep. 10, 15 years ago. They probably would have been killed 20 years ago. So there that's our fault as a as a collective society and until we change that this stuff is going to continue it is right now there are kids being sexually abused right now and part of the reason why that kid will not tell anyone about it to get help is because we as a society are doing almost nothing to help that kid understand that they can step forward and say something now there are programs to teach kids, like, don't let people touch you here. Make sure you tell someone. That's great, but that's just a tiny little drop in an ocean of stigma. But, but I mean, I could... Uh, sure. So, two things, though. I don't think you can make a black and white, no pun intended, uh, argument about whether parents are guilty or not, right? Like, clearly, circumstances differ from case to case. And in this case, you asked me, and I said... I, I think so, especially the Australian mom, meaning that I was already categorizing them because honestly, the other one, I would start adding extenuating circumstances like, well, the kid was older and all your points are valid and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the one that brings the kid and within a, a, a brief meeting of the celebrity goes on on a family trip that they had planned and leaves their seven-year-old behind. That's bad in any circumstance. Forget the sexual abuse part. So it's like, no, she's to blame. And plus she was she was so about, like there's that s- s- telling scene when she arrives, he's supposed to be in the video for black and white. And they're like, oh, they're not paying for my house. What's going on? Why are, don't you start wondering like, wait, why are they paying for our houses? What What is it? What is the value we're giving these people that we're getting all this shit for free? You don't start wondering what Michael is getting out of this? Well, they did. <laughs> they did. But and a they little asked, too late, right? Well, they did, and they start asking the kids, and the kids were adamant that nothing happened. Right. The kids went to court saying nothing ever happened. Right. So if the kid is has been separated from Michael, and you're like, well... I've asked him a bunch of times, and I and and the moms were open to it. They weren't like, and if he did anything to you, I'm gonna punish you. Right. You know? but, so, but so even if you put those, there, yeah. you look at the evidence, you know, and they had suspicions. They were like, this is kind of weird, but I did talk sure. to my son, and I thought he would feel like he could tell me what was on, what was truthful. I thought he would tell me. That's well, the right. thing. But even if you put the the sex aside, let's say like it was all true. There's no way they could have known. Um, I mean, talk about like you know gauging when some relationship may not be the best for your for your son your young son right for example she knows in that moment she's like oh he's been replaced by some other kid it's like yeah like like this is this is not a balanced friendship you have here (laughs) yeah i get it and they liked michael jackson they they weren't he wasn't just a random dude these mothers loved this guy. Oh, he was, they were getting a lot of money and f- shit for free. Uh, the, and they, they and had they, a relationship with this they, guy. They he showed, he would, he would show up at their home right. and say, I love the, this family. And, you know, he would have dinner with them. He would, yep. he would hang out with them. He would praise them. It wasn't like he didn't, 
look like a snake in the grass. And from all accounts, from people who were close to him, he was a nice guy. And even Jimmy and Wade, particularly Jimmy will talk about this, because Jimmy actually hung out with him at, later in life. He's like, yeah, Michael, he was, he was, he's nice. He's a nice guy. Yep. He asks you questions. He, he's not, he doesn't impose his will on other people normally. He's very but, soft, you know? And so I, I think that... But even the older brother in his 2020, interviews... 2020, dude. 20 fucking No, 20. no, even the older brother in his interviews, he was like, he was upset because he was like, why is, she, why is well, mom he, going and well, moving he was, to the States But he wasn't upset about Michael. He was upset about his family being torn apart. But he, he sort of saw it as a weird thing. Yeah, At least the, the, in his but comments. not weird the way we right, see it. Right. You ask my opinion. I absolutely blame the mom in Australia. I don't know about the other one. And the second point is, we can't blame society if we can't start by blaming parents. It, let me ask you this. Yeah. Let's say that there wasn't sexual abuse happening. Yeah. But what was happening behind closed doors was... Um, I don't know. Well, I don't know if this is going to make any sense. Um, I, th I think I've said all I Well, I like if she, if she had dropped him off at a, not a Michael Jackson, if she had dropped him off at like uh, Disneyland, actually. I'm going to drop you off at Disneyland. Just stay in the park. Don't leave the park. Here's money for the rides. We're going to go on a trip. Uh, you're staying in this hotel and we'll talk to the one of the people here to make sure you get there. We'll be back in three days. I'd say like, yeah, that's a terrible mother. <laughs> Yeah, but that's not what she Even did. Even if he didn't get abused. So let me ask you this. Let's say you had a kid. Yeah. And your kid is seven years old. And to bring it to like, because Michael didn't do anything exotic. He did something extremely pedestrian in terms of how you groom a family and a child. So let's say you have a seven-year-old child and your best friend, you, whom you trust, you like, or maybe even less so like a coworker that you know really well, you've been working with him for five years. I don't want you to go here in your head because I don't want to sure. traumatize you, but, but just, you know. And uh, to, to make it less, to make, again, to make it more mundane, I suppose, more typical, say like the two of you get drunk, he sleeps over at, at the house on the right. couch, Nothing happens, but you don't, you know, you, nothing happens that you don't know about. Nothing happens that you know about. Um, the next week he comes over, uh, more drinking. He really plays well with your kids. Right. You kind of see that, like, oh, not, not a lot of my friends really interact with my seven-year-old daughter that way. Right, That's right, pretty right. cool. Another week goes by, he comes by, and he's like, hey, let's all go to Disneyland. And you're like, wow, okay. I mean, that's kind of cool. Yeah, we could hang out and, you know, bring both our kids and, we'll, you know, go to Disneyland. Step by step by step. Now, yeah, he doesn't sleep with he doesn't, person, he doesn't though. sleep with her. He doesn't sleep with your daughter in a bed. Right. But s somehow there are things that happen where you might not even know yeah. that they're off by themselves. You're just like not yeah. paying attention or you, well, think, you think they're in different parts of the house when in right. fact they're in the same part of the house. But that's a, I mean, that's a night and day difference. Is that your fault? Uh, if I am not paying any attention, I'm going to be somewhat at fault. But if this is really like... If he's really good at figuring out how to manipulate the situation playing the long con. Well, well, sure. That's why I'm saying this isn't a black and white thing. You, you got to take it at like, what are the facts? And if the uh, well, facts are... I, I want to get the, I want to get the answer though. Like, I think you said it, but yeah, I, are I think, you to blame? I think I might be depending on, on the details. I just get with the details I gave you. Well, the, are you I to mean, blame? but if, if this is a thing that we've known him for years, he comes over, I never leave, like explicitly leave them alone and things like that. And then it turns out that there were times where I was upstairs and he like quickly did st That sucks. But- Are you to blame? Not entirely. Right. Because like, I mean, that, almost that, maybe not, right? Right. But that's a very different case. Well, in my, in my what I saw, that's what I saw, but was to, someone who very slowly- worked their way into it that, and, and broke it down. They had just met him and they left the kid there while they went to the Grand Canyon. 
That's not slowly. Okay, well, so maybe that, but but again, yeah. later on, well, she, she did have suspicions, analogy, and she checked in with him, and she was like, "Well, I don't know." Right. Like, like, but if you had used that analogy, I would have absolutely said, "Hey, well, the, my, the, you know, for me because of what I went through, that would have never happened." And B, if it did happen, I would absolutely be to blame. My my, uh, well, again, you say that, and I I trust on some level, but I wouldn't be surprised if something had happened that you wouldn't have known about. There's just no way to know when you have kids. Oh, it's, sure. It's, it's you know, it's just like right. You, you're never, you don't have constant eyes right. on your child. But, sure, but they like, can get abused at school, at the daycare. But but let, let, forget sexual abuse for a second. Just a seven year old got hurt. He hit his head. He has a concussion. Okay, that's the facts. And then we're asking the question: Are the parents to blame in this case? Could you definitively say that in no case they would be to blame? I'm saying that the, well, I guess, so I guess we should just go a percentage blame, maybe. Yeah, because I would say these parents are 25% to blame. Okay, fine. And so I would say, just like with the concussion, the parents were at work, the child was at school, he fell off a thing. No, the parents are not to blame. They sent them to a safe school, right? Uh, different case, the parents were at home, they saw him climbing on a ladder without support, they saw him up there dancing, and then he fell on his head and... Yeah, the parents are fucking to blame. <laughs> but just to use that analogy, imagine he, he, at the age of four, climbed like the couch. At the age of five, he climbed something bigger. At the age of six, he was climbing trees. At the age of seven, he was like regularly like brand climbing on all. Right. At the age of eight, he's climbing. He's never fallen. And then right. he falls and hits his right. head. That's a different scenario. Different that, scenario. That's, that's a progression. Yeah. Now, if we just check in and we're like, you let your child climb that tree without any supervision. You're like, well, you don't understand. Like, if you just say it that way, yeah, it sounds awful. But you weren't there for the progression. But right. But that's why I'm saying when you just met him and then you go on your family trip and leave your seven-year-old behind for but days. Did, did the abuse happen right away? Yeah, it started that time. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying that's not a thing. Like, that's not a thing. Sure. I mean, that... That part of it, I'll, I'll go with you on that one. But so, the overall so thing, because agree, my, my point yeah, about all this yeah. is that I have talked to countless parents who have had kids who have been through horrific abuse of various different kinds. Yeah. And if we're going to say that it's the parent's fault, right. we're blaming the fucking victim. It is I Michael Jackson's fault. I right. The parents had very little knowledge or education or awareness. They were tricked. They were bamboozled. They had a extremely astute, uh, powerful abuser who was very good at what they did. Right. And I just don't think we should be looking at them because think of all the other parents out there watching this who were like, you know, that's me. And I thought I loved my kids. Right. I thought I cared. Now I'm a monster. Right. I, I don't feel like I'm a monster. Yeah, I can go along with all of that. And and I'll be clear that it's not like I'm saying like, well, the mother, the mother needs to be thrown in jail or something, right? I think it's like the guys, when they were asked, I think that's where the truth lies. Have you forgiven your mom or your parents? And they said, I'm working on it. And I think if that mother hasn't come and had a really heart to heart and sort of expressed what she feels she could have done whatever, then she's not helped him because he was the little boy. Right. You know. So, having said all that, <clears throat> the mother of uh, the Robson mother, there were a lot of details, like leaving Wade at the age of seven alone with yeah. Michael right away, that indicated that the mother in general was neglectful. Yeah. She, upon the documentary being published... Uh, she has since she can't watch the. Oh right, she could. She was like, I don't want to watch this. Right. She yeah. she she. Which on one level I get because yeah. as a as a parent you just, it's too hard to. It'd be like watching you know if someone <laughs> posted a video of your kid being killed. Yeah, totally. On YouTube, you know you're not gonna watch that. So on some level, absolutely. But Wade has come forward and said. I want her to watch this. I need her to see what happened to me. Yeah. And she still, uh, you know, apparently was not going to do that. And the other mother wasn't that way. You right. know, the other mother was more just like, she seemed more compassionate and more caring. <sighs> totally. Um, and there's also, if you read between the lines, I think the older brother 
probably even before even meeting Michael Jackson had some kind of problem with the mom to begin with. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and then of course, Wade now is still like, I'm still working on it. Did Jimmy, uh, uh, did, they, he, did he forgive his mom? They both said they're still working on it. I think, I don't, I don't remember. The, oh, sorry. This was in the Oprah episode. Uh, she said, have you guys forget? Because uh, I think they ask in the documentary as well. Yeah. Right? In the Oprah thing, she said, well, have you now forgiven your parents? And they both said, I'm working on it. I felt like, it might be crazy, but I think the... the Jimmy? The Australian one? Is Wade, that Wade. Wade. I felt like... Oh, no, it must have been Jimmy. No, they both said they were still working on it. What what happens though is Wade... And it's interesting, of course, that the men are implicated, the fathers, uh, which is a whole other thing. It's just like, yeah. well, at least the mothers were paying attention enough that right. the fathers, uh, at least the way they were telling the story, it's... I mean, of course, one dad was sort of being thrown away, the Australian dad, but... Was, anyway. was the seven-year-old the one that became in Sync's choreographer? Yeah. Okay, that was Wade? Yeah. Okay. So... Oddly, which is surprising to me, he felt he felt when I was watching it less tortured, and maybe it's because he's been through more therapy than watching the other guy. Because the other guy seemed like, oh man, he barely wanted to be there. <laughs> yeah, in the Oprah thing. Yeah. So, in conclusion, I'll say that I have more visceral because I have I wasn't sexually abused. Right. And so I have, it's a foreign thing and it's such a specific thing. Yeah. There's really nothing else like it, I think. And if you haven't been through it, this sort of documentary, I think, will be half the education that you would ever need, I think. Yeah. Or bring you halfway down the road, shall I say. And I have a much more visceral understanding of what you went through. Right. The... You've talked about it on the podcast, and, and per, we talked about it personally way before we talked about it on the podcast. And the, the progression is so similar to you with these guys. You know, the, yeah. the acting like it was no big deal, the uh, running away from it, the acting out, <clears throat> the uh, eventual settling down in life, the eventual, oh my God, and the symptoms and the therapy and all that stuff. And I just think for people out there listening who have been following the podcast and Umberto's discussion of it, I, I just think that um, I commend you for coming out. Cause you know, you, you wouldn't have, this is not one of those things that is like super comfortable to talk about. Right. You're telling the entire internet about it. And similar to Wade and Jimmy, it's like, well, if you people don't, then who is right. And how many people are benefited from you talking about it? At the very least, just to have compassion, but also like how, you know, because I think Jimmy came out first, and then Wade was heard Jimmy come out, and Wade was like, "Well, I guess I'm going to come out now too." Yeah. And the Me Too movement, you know, just all this stuff that's that is coming out. It it, it this is what gives us power. Talking about it, you totally. talking about it, Berto, Wade, Jimmy, all the other people coming forward and talking about it, this is the way that we fight back against the abusers. Mm -hmm. If we all talk about it right away, it reduces stigma. It alerts the authorities. It alerts our caregivers. It gives kids the idea that, oh, I, oh. Can, I can say that? That's yeah. What, that's what, it's not my fault. And I'm, like adults that have been through that when they were kids, now they say it, that it was a terrible thing. So... Maybe it's not a great thing. Think about the teenagers that have watched this documentary right. and are like, it saves them 20 years of, of <sighs> symptoms. And they're like, actually, that happened to me too. I, yeah. I guess I can come forward now too. And the emotional release of watching this, as, as you said, which I totally get. I mean, it was emotional for me and you know, I, I right. couldn't relate to it you know, personally. And so this is how we fight it is by talking about it. The Me Too in general culture is the way that we save ourselves and our children. It also alerts us as a society and as a industry to the perpetrators so we can get them treatment. A lot of them don't wanna do this. It, it, or they would love an alternative. 
Think if Michael Jackson at the age of like 18 went to a therapist and said, I have a sexual attraction to kids. Can you help me with this? Yeah. Um, okay, let's start from the beginning, Michael. What was your life like? Well, right. my dad systematically essentially tortured me from the earliest I can remember. Hmm. There were a lot of weird sexual things going on in my family. Like my dad forced me to sing in a strip club when I was a kid, and I, that was weird. My mom was extremely sexually repressed and was very shaming about sex. My dad beat the crap out of my older siblings and my mom. Um, I've got 10 years of therapy right there. Right. Let alone like the urges I have for attachment. Because that's the other thing, like you, you get a clear picture that Michael Jackson's primary attachments were these boys. Yeah. And if and without that, he he wouldn't have anybody to attach yeah. to. That's why people do this sort of thing typically. Now there's a lot of different roads to child molestation. There's compulsion, sexual sadism. But it seemed like Michael Jackson's was he just in the same way that um you know, I, now that I'm out as a heterosexual married man, in the same way that I, from the age of 16 or earlier, wanted a same age, opposite sex, mm -hmm. uh, you know, companion slash, you know, sexual partner. Right. Um, Michael Jackson wanted a same sex, younger, uh, romantic slash sexual partner because it gave him a secure base of attachment. He wasn't attached to anyone else, really. And it's monstrous and an evil thing that he did. But imagine if he was able to get his attachment needs through some other way, and he wouldn't have to turn to these these abusive, horrific ways to do so. Totally. Uh, what's the final word, bro? Well, I will say that one other realization I had when I was crying and kind of breaking down uh, I, I mentioned that I was asking myself, what, where's the pain? And what happens is I was asking because the memories I have, they're not in, in and of themselves painful because this wasn't a, like you said, sadistic or like a, I was being hit at the same time or, or even it, the, the act itself wasn't painful or whatever. So it, it's, it's not pain from that. Um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like the person that was abusing me was insulting me, yelling at me, threatening my life. It wasn't pain from that. So I was like, what's the pain? And the, the best I could piece it was, uh, and maybe you have a thought on it, but it was a lot of it, I think, was this little child when it was happening, part of me that wasn't verbal was sitting there going, where's an adult around here? Like, wh who's around to help me navigate through this? Because I feel... Like I'm here by myself. Hmm. And not only that, like my mom had left, but now my dad's not here. And like, what's going on? Like, and that is like this feeling of being totally abandoned to this world I don't understand. Hmm. That's kind of what I came up with in my head. And what, what was telling is this feeling of pain had very little to do with the specifics of the abuse, right? Hmm. And I, I got into this debate a while ago where I was... Um, this very unfortunate debate with someone that had also been abused. Um, and she started essentially minimizing my abuse because it wasn't violent and, and things like that. And I just, I got very upset about that. I'm like, you know, yeah, I, you told me that story. Yeah. And so I think, um, I think anyone who's been abused at a young age, it, it's not a matter of like, well, how badly were you abused? If they were abused at a young age, there's going to be that pain and it can be devastating to their life. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Again, illuminating to me that it's not just the exploitation of someone else at someone else's hands directly, but it's also the wider implication of, well, where is my support system? Right. How how did they let this happen to me? What does that mean about my security? What does that mean about their feelings about Am me? Am I unloved? Am I useless? Am I, yeah, all these things. Do they love me? Yeah. Do they care? None of it verbalized at that age or anything, just. But a total gestalt of what yeah. childhood is. Yeah. You know, there, there's not a, when a child is 18 months old and they're crying and you go to them and pick them up, they're not consciously thinking, oh, I have a support system, <laughs> you know? There's just this general like <laughs> vibe of uh, of like whatever nonverbal right. feeling of support system. Yeah. 
and it it just and they just sort of bounce from feeling to feeling at that at that at that age and it's it's no different when you're a little older as a child right you don't typically think consciously about those things but you walk away from these incidents with a new learning about how the world works and how you fit in it right and one of the lessons that can be learned from those situations is i'm alone my parents don't love me enough to be to be be here in this moment for me um people are not safe yeah uh, sex is weird and confusing and apparently connected to to uh pa- dominance right. sex sex is a is a dominant act oh right dominant right. submissive act uh people's bodies are uh, not your own yeah <laughs> Uh, you know, blah, 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 depending on how you interpreted, you know, the thing yeah. non-verbally, so to speak. But anyway, well, uh, so tell us what you think. I hope that, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, maybe hopefully I'll connect this episode with the one on YouTube because a lot of people are like commenting like, what the fuck? 60, 40, what kind of idiot is this? And, <laughs> and so. <laughs> I'll show you what kind of idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining. And thanks, Berto, for uh, helping us all to understand what uh, this is like and the effects of it. Um, why should people take care of themselves, Bruno? Because they all and we all deserve it.